Welcome to this webinar, Design Considerations, Innovation and Sustainability, which is hosted in association with NAF Installation. My name is Thomas Lane, and I am the Group Technical Editor of Building Magazine at EcoBuild, and I am chairing today's session. Innovation has the potential to offer better environmental performance on projects and save money as well. This can bring competitive advantage to those companies that innovate. However, there are downsides. Innovation is risky, as there are no guarantees a new idea or product will deliver good performance reliably throughout the life of a building. This could cause problems for those who specified those innovative solutions further down the line. Because of these risks, many are reluctant to adopt new ideas, which make it difficult to make innovations commercially successful because of the perceived risks. Today we're going to discuss these issues, and I'm joined by four speakers. Our first speaker is Manish Datta, who is the head of Property Plan A at Marks and Spencers. We have Ross Holleron, who is an associate director at BRE. Hugh Blackwell, who is an executive sustainability consultant at Hall Lee Sustainability. And finally, Ian Gornall, who is the head of manufacturing for NAF Installation at St. Helens. During the presentations, I would encourage you to submit questions using your dashboard, and once all the presentations are over, we'll, we will endeavor to answer as many of these as possible. So over to our first speaker, who is Manish Datta, who is going to give an introduction to Marks & Spencer's EcoStores, looking at a few of their particularly innovative solutions and some of the lessons learned. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Tom. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be on this webinar, my first, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to talk today just briefly about what Plan A is, uh, just uh, for those that don't know, and uh, talk about the progress we've made and the role of innovation within Plan A, uh, particularly in our built environment. Um, today's a very timely webinar. We launch our 2012 to 13 Plan A report, which you can access through our website, which tells you about the progress overall we've made against Plan A uh, since we launched it in 2006. Um, we've achieved 139 out of 180 commitments, with the rest largely on track. And in that time period, we've uh, gained some £320 million worth of benefit due to Plan A. Um, last year, that was £135 million. So that's really good for business as well. So launched it uh, five years, uh, six years ago now, and this is the way we launched it. Um, Plan A has become a really integral part of Marks & Spencer's strategy. And within the built environment, we all know why this is such a big cause for us. Um, not m and stats in this slide, but stats overall that are well known in the industry. Um, buildings use a lot of natural resources, a lot of energy, and a lot of CO2 emissions, and are quite a big challenge in terms of um, reducing our overall impact on, on the planet. We take a very holistic approach of this uh, to this challenge uh, within Plan A and our built environment globally. Um, we've got some 700 stores in the UK, 450 internationally, that equates to about 20 million square foot. That's a huge challenge, both in terms of volume and also in terms of diversity and geography. Um, I spoke earlier about 180 commitments under Plan A. 21 of those are owned by the property group is what I'm ultimately responsible for delivering. And um, there are some really big um, challenges within that around energy, around waste, around water. Um, we're required also to change the way we manage our existing buildings and introduce new ones, bringing Plan A much closer to the way we want to do business, make it uh, how we do business, which is what the HWDB stands for there. Um, sustainable learning stores, which I'll go into a lot more depth later, allow us to experiment, uh, evaluate and embed uh, innovation, both in terms of uh, product, technology, but also in terms of ways of working, and I'll cover this a bit more in detail later. What I hope you'll notice from this slide is that we at Marks & Spencer have a holistic view uh, towards sustainability that goes beyond the traditional carbon, water, and waste, and also tackles things like health and well-being and sourcing of materials. So I, I just want to take you through very quickly what the progress has been against um, some of those uh, commitments and then dwell a bit more deeper into um, sustainable learning stores and the role innovation plays in those. 
So this slide just talks to you about some of those headlines. Uh, this year, um, up to this year, we've made 31% energy efficiency gains in our stores. We're 27% water efficient in our stores. All our electricity for the UK and Ireland comes from renewable sources, 23% of which comes from um, small-scale renewables. And we've reduced our CO2 emissions from refrigeration by 60% over the last six years. And all of this has been down to some quite interesting um, innovations that we've taken at scale into our existing estate. So um, things like control systems, energy efficient lighting, um, we've rolled out to now over 350 stores. Uh, things like water rest urinals and flush controls, uh, we've rolled out to a significant number of stores as well. And also aggressively detecting uh, wastage, both in terms of water and leaks and also refrigeration emissions, uh, gas emissions has been a big part of that strategy. We've also um, achieved um, some quite impressive progress in terms of waste. So none of our waste um, goes to landfill, uh, both operationally and from our property activities, in particular construction. And in fact, over the last year, we've managed to reduce our construction waste by 50%. Um, 50% um, is um, a big achievement for us. We're very proud of that. It's one thing making sure that your waste doesn't go to landfill. The next big frontier that you have to then face is making sure that none of it, um, and, uh, that you don't generate as much in the first place. Our stores are made out of um, more or less 100% FSC timber. Um, we've, uh, all our main contractors that we use in our store builds are FSC certified, which is fantastic. And um, we also believe that buildings can be great havens for biodiversity. This is a picture on the top right corner of your screen of our store at Cheshire Oaks, which I'll talk, to, talk about uh, a bit later. So on to what really wanted to uh, cover, which was sustainable learning stores. These stores are um, kind of innovation hotbeds for us. So these are where we're in, uh, these stores enable us to try some new things out that we wouldn't normally um, in a real live environment, which is where you can really tell whether they work or not. And we don't just um, do this and then cut the ribbon and walk away from the stores. We actually study them quite deeply and more about that later. So this is um, our first learning store in our current series, opened in 2011 in Sheffield. It's Ecclesall Road Sustainable Learning Store. Some of its features are uh, it's our first 100% LED store. It's got heat reclaim technology in it, which means that the waste, waste heat from the refrigeration is uh, reused in the store. Um, it's got some interesting material stories. So we used for the first time in our estate recycled bricks for the envelope on the outside. Um, we are also it's 100% FSE timber, both in build and fit out. Uh, it's got quite a lot of biodiversity. You'll see from the picture the green wall, but also uh, some 60-odd uh, new plants planted across the car parking and landscape generally. It's got a huge rainwater harvesting tank below it. And then some of the more procedural innovations that we've tried is, is better community engagement. This score, score, um, store scored 37.5 out of 40 in considerate constructors, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just about technology. It's also about process uh, as far as innovation goes for Marks & Spencer. We then uh, followed that store up later in the year in September 2011 with um, our first shopping centre sustainable learning store in Westfield, East London. And as you can see from the screen, it has some uh, interesting attributes as well. And it was also our highest ever Bream Excellence store. And I suppose the great innovation here uh, was actually perhaps not to be called innovation, but collaboration with Westfield in trying to make sure that uh, their shell and core works and our fit out worked um, in synergy to achieve a really high Bream rating. Taking the plan internationally is a big challenge for Marks & Spencer and really proud of the achievement of a chair, of, of opening a store in March um, 2012 um, in New Delhi, uh, which was the first high street lead platinum shop and I think still the only lead platinum shop out in India, um, which we are incredibly proud of. And this store has features such as rainwater harvesting, low energy lighting, sustainable materials used in its construction. Um, and that was no mean feet really given the context of where it was being uh, built and we'd like again to do more of those uh, in India as well. Um, the next store, oops, just jumped a slide, bear with me. Okay, um, the next store I'm going to talk about in this series of sustainable learning stores is one we've opened most recently which was in August last year which is up near Chester, a store called Cheshire Oaks. Um, <clears throat> Not only does the store uh, have a number of sustainable features, it's also 
the second largest in the world, uh, to give you an idea of its scale, and the biggest we've ever built. The entire footprint off this site is about half a million square feet, so it's, it's not a small store. And in this store, you'd find uh, things like hemp walls, um, so uh, hemp clad panels that, um, uh, that, that are on the edge, uh, on the edge of the envelope. Uh, it's also partially sunk into the ground to take advantage of some of the natural insulation properties of the earth. It's got an FSC glue lamp timber roof, um, in it. Uh, it's got 228 new trees planted around it, a 300 meter square green wall, a picture of which we saw earlier. It's achieved some really high scores in, in terms of uh, uh, connecting with the community, 38 out of 40 with considerate constructors. And also, um, our main contractor there used uh, social media widely to take the store outside from behind the hoardings and into the local community using technology, which was um, the first time we've ever done that. Um, we've used a lot of recycled materials in this store, in the roof, in the floor, in the walls, and that's enabled us to reduce its embodied carbon by 37%. There's a lot of emphasis we feel on operational carbon. We also like to focus on embodied carbon as well. And I hope what, you, what this demonstrates in the four sort of little case studies that I've just shown is that we take a holistic approach. But as I said earlier, we don't walk away from these stores once we've uh, built them. We, we think there's a, a much bigger job to do in measuring and monitoring them. And this is what this uh, diagram is trying to do, is saying that there's a constant loop of feedback in terms of what works and what doesn't. And as a result of that, we uh, conduct post-occupancy evaluations in all these stores. We're in the middle of doing um, a POE at uh, Cheshire Oaks. The store is performing really well, both environmentally and in terms of sales, which always helps, and is multi-award winning, and we're delighted to win the Guardian Sustainable Business Award for Built Environment, uh, which is incredibly motivating and encourages us to do more. Just to move into the future now, and um, from a Marks and Spencer point of view, what some of the challenges are that are faced by us, and, and the role that innovation can play in meeting some of these challenges. So, what this is uh, trying, this uh, slide is trying to do, is trying to say we're going to be faced a, against a, an energy challenge. So, as we try and make our stores more appealing. We are trying to become more efficient, but at the same time, we're becoming more intense as well, as you can see by some of these um, lit um, units in the top left picture. Uh, legislation will push us. Um, so when it's properly defined, the ambition for zero carbon in, in new non-domestic buildings by 2019 uh, will push us towards reducing our impact. The fact that we want to be an international retailer and have you know, 30 plus stores in India, 10 plus stores in, in China, 450 in total across the world outside the UK means that globalization uh, is a big challenge for us as well. So we've achieved uh, some uh, progress in the UK and we'd like to rep replicate it across the world. That's a challenge in itself. And of course, climate change resilience. Uh, will today's buildings be fit for purpose for tomorrow's climate? Are they even today? And indeed, how does this work across the world? Another challenge that we have to face. And some of the demographic challenges to buildings. So um, an aging population, uh, consumers getting older and behaving, but behaving at atypically. You know, um, con older consumers in buildings will use them slightly differently to the way we're used to. The worsening health problem in, in society is going to put pressure on, uh, on buildings and how buildings are used as well. The vibrant, impatient youth, particularly in the east uh, part of the globe, wanting to get to places quickly, <clears throat> wanting comfort, but also wanting efficiency. That's going to push us. And of course, wider and much bigger is the broadening inequality in terms of uh, the world, um, economic success not reaching the majority and causing societal tension and frustration. Um, and that picture on the bottom right kind of typifies where the built environment um, plays a role in that. Um, technology, I think, is, is a big, has a big role to play in the future. So smart buildings, um, where technology keeps users informed about the, 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 not just the products they're buying, but the way the building is performing very quickly and instantly and in a live way. BIM and the use of BIM will enable designers, clients, constructors to accurately predict the building before it goes up. Um, We've used some of this in Cheshire Oaks and learned a great deal from it. Our vision is to use BIM much more within our estate as we go forward. We believe that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good technology that we'd like to trial. So in summary, <coughs> I'd like to say that a few big messages at the end, which is actually we keep mining for more and more innovation. 90% of it exists today. Uh, we should just focus on getting that 90% properly evaluated in the different built environments that we've got. Um, we need to concentrate on not just environmental but business cash benefit as well. Um, we, we would like 
innovation to be holistic, not just focusing on carbon and water and the traditional environmental metrics, but a more wider environmental approach and sustainable approach. We'd like innovation to be retrofitable. The biggest challenge we've got, and I'm sure most people have got, is their existing estate. It's no good finding innovations that are only applicable to new buildings. And of course, evaluation in use is really critical. Too much innovation escapes without being fully evaluated. And collaboration is going to be a key in that. Collaboration between NGOs, clients, um, designers, constructors, really key in that. So that kind of brings a close to my um, presentation. I'm sorry if it's gone a bit over, but I look forward to the Q&A later. Great. Thanks very much for that, Manish. Before we move on to our next presenter, we've got a poll for you. Um, which will appear on your screen any second now. If you could just quickly choose one of the three options, and um, then we'll get show you the results, which should come up within seconds, hopefully. Do we have our results? So, um, a clear win is people would go for products, rather unsurprisingly, that offer improved environmental performance for the same cost as traditional solutions. Um, does any of our panel have any comment on this at all? No? Okay. Um, well, move Tom, on to Tom I'd like to come in. I, I, I think that's really key. So if we can get there and show economic benefit as well as environmental benefit at a cost-neutral position, I think that's got to be the way forward from yeah. a client's point of view. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean I guess that what you, what you were after really is that sort of, um, you know, hitting regulations, hitting better environmental performance, but no extra cost. I mean, what sort of premium would you be prepared to pay if you had to pay more? I mean, in, in some of the investments we've made in our uh, sustainable learning stores, we've, we've made those additional investments because we believe that, you know, that, that we wanted to learn from them and test them. But, of course, it depends on how you evaluate them. You can't just evaluate them on the upfront capital costs. You've got to take a whole life approach to it, which is what we do. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I guess the challenge is really if you're doing um, a speculative development and you're really only looking at the upfront cost and that's when that question really becomes it is but of course buildings are not just up for a year or so they're up for a lot longer absolutely great well thanks for that um, we're now going to move on to our next speaker who is Ross Holleran from BRE yeah. and Ross is going to talk about the BRE's work on energy performance with a look at regulations and targets and he's also going to discuss key drivers for innovation thank you great thank you Tom um, some interesting themes coming out of, uh, of those first the first presentation, and particularly perceptions of value and the need for collaboration and, and measuring what innovation actually delivers, which feeds quite uh, well into what I wanted to speak to you about, which was two key examples from my perspective of the work that we've been doing in the residential sector. One, looking at a really big driver for innovation and change within new build, which is uh, a move to as-built performance in the regulatory environment and the other is looking at refurbishment um, and looking at how savings are actually achieved in, in the real world. So I'll, I'll start with the new build sector. This is work that I've been doing, I've spent a lot of my time in the last three years probably, seconded to the Zero Carbon Hub, uh, looking at initially the Fabric Energy Efficiency Performance Standard, uh, carbon compliance. Um, and more recently working on the um, design versus as-built um, task group. And what, what's emerged from the previous two task groups uh, and from um, studies by people like EST and Technology Strategy Board, Joseph Roundtree Trust and some work by BRE themselves is that there is evidence showing that there's a difference uh, in, in some cases between what we envisage at the design stage uh, for residential buildings and what's actually delivered on site. Um, and it's very important to understand the, some of the subtleties around this area. This is not about uh, how the building performs when you put a human being in the box, because as many of us appreciate, human being is probably one of the most random animals on the planet. It's about more of the miles per gallon perception of this building should perform under these conditions in a particular way. Um, so what we've been looking at in this task group is 
understanding the line at the top is the key one, the knowledge gap in this area. There's emerging evidence, but there's certainly much more to be discovered. So what we've been doing as the task group is looking at the statement that came out of the previous carbon compliance uh, report, which was that from 2020, as you can see on the slide, the test results distribution uh, will demonstrate that at least 90% of the dwellings meet or better their performance. The key thing here is the date of 2020, so whilst this will relate to the regulations that are expected to come in 2016, there will be a, a, a period where the industry is going through learning, and that's begun already, hence the 2013, 16, 20 image at the bottom. Um, this, I believe, is a real game changer for the industry, because when we move from um, an as-designed compliance world to uh, an as-built compliance world, it's a little bit like changing from football to rugby. From the outside, they might look very similar, people chasing a ball, but actually the rules of the game are very different. And I believe that's why the industry as a whole has come together in the task group to collaborate, to understand what's actually happening in this area, because there's emerging evidence that, that people are interested and some concerned about, uh, but it's not definitive yet, and we need to really understand it better, because there's a risk, uh, and one of the first phrases that comes out in the task group discussions often is that we'll go chasing ghosts. We'll think that there's a particular thing that is causing a problem, but actually in reality it's a very small piece of the jigsaw. So we're drawing together all of the evidence that's available, or as much as we can at present, trying to identify gaps in that evidence base and agree a, a program of work that will take the residential sector from where we are at the moment to this um, objective for 90% uh, of, the, of the homes meeting or exceeding their design target by 2020. Trying to discover as well if there are quick wins that we can put in place to begin to deal with known areas uh, of concern. The government have given us a great opportunity with this task group to say we don't want to bring ever more draconian monitoring and policing of the construction industry. What we want to give you is the opportunity to show how you can deal with this in a proactive cost-neutral way to feed back to the comment earlier, is there a way that you can deliver the process differently so that you can achieve these kind of targets? Working collaboratively is absolutely key. We've got uh, on the industry um, executive committee, because obviously it's very important with a task group like this that you don't go away, dream up lots of academic ways of achieving the, the, the objectives and then find that the industry that has to deliver them thinks that you've, you've lost all contact with reality. So we've got chief execs from Miller, Redrow, Persimmon, Press Nicholson, Barrett, and manufacturers such as uh, Canal from H&H &H, um, on executive committee reviewing what's being produced by the work groups. And the diagram I'm just showing you now is the breadth of work that's underway. One of the key challenges, we believe, for the industry is to not work within silos. And you may look at this diagram and think, well, what you've done is created silos for research. How will you ever break across those silos? That's one of the big challenges. The initial phase of work that kicked off back in March up until now has been to gather evidence and to produce these groups so that we can look in depth at the different stages of delivering a building. And it's really important to spot that across the bottom there's verif verification and testing in line and end of line and construction joint details. There are many cross-cutting issues that need to be dealt with. One, for example, is that maybe at the moment the only tool we have to look at the overall system performance of the fabric of the building is known as coheating. So to give you a, a quick synopsis of that, it, it's where you take a building, you heat it for a period of time using electric fan and panel heaters, so you can measure the energy required to go into the building to sustain it at a particular temperature, and then you can get an overall fabric heat loss. That, if we were to say it was applied for every building before handover from 2016 onwards with paralyzed <laughs> delivery of housing, obviously, which would be a really big problem. So it's about working out how do you maybe take some of the lessons from other industries where you have quality assurance checks and processes in line so you're not testing for failure, but you're monitoring for success, which sounds a little bit like a consultancy glib comment, but it's really important. Across the top of this diagram is the cross-cutting uh, process group, which is one that I'm playing an active role in, we've got a really interesting challenge, which is to try and map the delivery of housing um, and residential buildings. And it may sound simple, but if you think that previous projects like Egan and various others 
have tried to map the process, you realize that actually there's a big difference between large and small builders, maybe large and small developments. The way you actually procure, is it design and build, is it uh, labor and materials, or just labor itself, all has an influence on the flow of information about the performance of the building that's required. I think this is where we will actually see some really big innovation within industry, so in how we test products from when we design them, we manufacture them, how we actually produce the products so that they interface as a system when they're in the building. So those junctions that we regularly know aren't easy to produce on site on a wet Friday afternoon. There's a feedback loop to the design team and then to the manufacturers to say, if you tweak it this way, we won't need to adjust it on site, which produces irregular performance. The actual process of construction, the monitoring of that, the control, maybe even the way that things are procured, making sure that there are elements of the procurement packages that explain to those trades what is an acceptable level of performance before and after they're in the building. So in summary, this work group is at the research and identification stage at the moment. We're looking at mapping the process, gathering the evidence, understanding where the gaps are. It's a really exciting and challenging task group that I think is a testament to the way that the industry can come together to collaborate for a really big challenge, but something that everybody acknowledges is something that we want to deal with. I'm going to move to the refurbishment sector now and look at Green Deal and in-use factors. And I just want to make a really important point here, which is that often uh, people see the previous new build challenge and the refurbishment in use factors as one and the same thing. And, and it's my belief that they are very different, which is that in the new build sector, it's about up to the point where you hand the keys over for the property and its performance at that stage. Within Green Deal, it's a very different challenge because you've got incumbent occupants they're being given an expectation of you will save X amount per year by installing these measures. And there's similar evidence emerging that actually when you install uh, products and systems into existing buildings, often they don't actually achieve the performance uh, that was expected. So DEC have included a number of in-use factors, as they're termed, to deal with some of the vagaries within this process. And it's important because they're used when, it when it's uh, calculating the Green Deal financing package. And an important point to pause on here is one of the big drivers here is concern within the financing industry about people being able to pay for the Green Deal measures uh, through their bills over time. And there are a number of different areas where vagaries come in, differences in lab versus site testing, installation, the performance of the existing fabrics itself, and to a degree, comfort taking of the occupants. So one of the areas where I believe there will be opportunity for big innovation is the area of changing these in-use factors and in the future product differentiation. So within the documentation that DEC have produced so far, there are a list of the percentage in-use factors that are applied to a number of different measures, uh, wall insulation, roof insulation, boilers, controls, etc. Um, and there is an opportunity each year for data to be brought forward to be reviewed by the measures expert group, which is a, a panel created by, by DEC for, of industry uh, experts in this area. And if evidence can be brought forward um, in the summer period, this kind of time, and reviewed, then when DEC updates every spring, the in-use factor at the generic measure level could be changed. There's a big challenge at the moment, which is what evidence is required to actually justify a change in the in-use factors, and that's being defined uh, at present by DEC. But you could have the expectation it would fall into a, a number of areas, which would be field trials, monitoring of particular properties, uh, and maybe even a review of industry practice itself. Uh, so quality um, process management on the refurbishment and the commissioning of the, of the properties. Again, I would imagine there will be innovations in this area looking at accuracy and repeatability of delivering the refurbishment. And I think because this is also about what people see through their bills and the energy that they save, there will be a really big interest on user interface design, people understanding how they actually use the new heating system, the new control system uh, in, in an effective way. And we'll also see a rapid increase in 
uh, monitoring systems that can review at a population level what buildings are doing and then ideally be able to drill down and say, okay, so of these buildings, X percent of this age band are uh, overperforming or underperforming and drill down with some more forensic monitoring to say, is it because of, uh, we think, maybe the installation or is the occupant behaving in a way that is very different to expected? I think we'll see some really big changes there. So in summary, um, I think we'll see some really big changes within new build because of this shift to uh, an as-built compliance territory, and I think we will see big changes in green deal and refurbishment because of the in-use factors. Collaboration will be absolutely key, and sharing the evidence that we gather in a coherent way uh, will move the industry as a whole forward. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Ross, for that. Um, before we move on to our next speaker, we've got another poll. Um, so if, if the poll, poll could be posted up, please. If you could just answer one of the three options, and we'll wait a few seconds for you to do that, and then we'll see what the results are. Could you publish the results? Uh, any comments from our panel? Yeah, Ian Gorn all here from uh, Canal for Insulation. I'm not surprised that the option three is the is the lowest uh, score. That's um, something that we definitely uh, wouldn't wouldn't agree with. Uh, we'd probably um, choose somewhere between option one and option two. Um, the, the slight caveat for option one is that there has to be some commercial uh, reality. We're not saying that uh, it has to be the cheapest solution, um, but the, 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 there has to be a commercial uh, realism uh, associated with that. Great. Thanks, Ian. I mean, it's quite encouraging, really, isn't it? Because, I mean, the industry has known, been so conservative when it comes to embracing innovation. And we've only got 1.7% of our audience um, saying that they, um, that's not a concern for them. That's pretty, that's pretty good going, really. Um, we need to move on now to our next speaker, who is Hugh Blackwell from Hawley, who is going to talk about the energy modelling of projects and how to predict this accurately with a case study. Hugh. Hello, um, my name is Hugh Blackwell, I've uh, just been introduced um, and um, I've got a rather more specific example to talk through today uh, to do with innovation and understanding innovation and managing the risk with innovation. Um, just a quick comment on that poll result, um, what I would uh, pose perhaps an interesting philosophical question is, uh, if an innovation is two years old before you adopt it, is it actually still an innovation? Um, that's uh, that's something I think something to take away and think about. But um, today I'm going to talk about um, a bit about residential sector and um, and energy modelling um, and um, using energy modelling to understand innovation before you actually do undertake construction um, and understanding innovation in two particular ways. Um, Number one, uh, perhaps using energy modelling to demonstrate innovation uh, in particular with respect to some issues of Partel, and so showing that perhaps we're doing better than um, some compliance methods might describe. Uh, and number two is using energy modelling to um, perhaps control some of the risks of that uh, innovation. Um, so I'm going to take you through the uh, the concept and show you some um, show you some work that we've done and we, we do for some of our clients um, and, uh, and then show you some results and hopefully from that you can take away um, how how um, how these um, um, these two points can be um, um, uh, sort of developed on them can be understood so um, we'll just run you briefly through the concept of this particular this particular scheme um, so what we've done here is we're, we're demonstrating um, our concept um, using a, what we call a, a shoebox model. Um, so we, we've, demonstrated, we've, we've constructed a very simple um, model to show some principles, but we can un, um, expand this to be as complicated or as, uh, or, or as simplified to, uh, to any extent to, um, to match someone's needs. Um, and we've taken a residential scheme, or a residential occupation, I should say, um, and we've 
been looking at um, how two different modeling tools might um, might uh, predict energy demand in those uh, in that scenario and the first one is um, looking at the the sap route this is for the uninitiated this is the um, compliance tool that's used by part of the building regulations to uh, predict energy use and and carbon emissions uh, and this is a steady state statistical model um, I think this you know, when I talk about SAP, I say I think of it like a utility bill. It is grounded in reality. It is um, it is based upon statistics, but it is a static um, state calculator, and that makes it very quick. Um, but um, that also means that perhaps when um, some assumptions are not quite as um, lined up in the uh, in the tool, then then you might get different results in reality. And the second thing we're going to look at um, in our model is a, is a design tool. And in, in this particular case, it's um, uh, IES, but there is other software out there, and um, TAS and various other energy modeling um, software. Uh, at Hawley, we use multiple tools to do, do this approach. But in this particular case, um, we're just looking at it from um, IES. And this is a dynamic thermal modeling tool, which we can set up to do energy modeling. And, and we have complete control over what we are modeling and how we are modeling it. And that gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of um, trying to understand how a space, how a building is going to operate um, and, and changing perhaps some, something which, um, which we would like to modify and seeing what impact that might have on energy and therefore what impact that might have in, um, on carbon emissions. And that flexibility sometimes is lacking through the Partel SAP compliance route. And so um, our simple model is what we call a shoebox model. It's literally a cube on which we um, vary very few things. Um, and in this particular example, we are varying the proportion of glazing and the orientation um, and looking at how facade performance um, might, uh, or facade, different facade parameters might affect um, carbon emissions. Um, this particular size, 6 by 6, is very close to um, the minimum requirements of the GLA for um, a studio flat. So it's kind of representative of something of that kind of nature. But we, we try to pull out as much detail as possible to keep this as um, um, a simple analysis for the, for the purposes of um, just getting some principles um, understood. Um, and then what we've done in this particular example is we, we, we generate our assumptions. What, what are we going to plug into the model and, um, and how we... Um, uh, how we can actually run that model, um, and we, we, what we've done in particular is we've gone through SAP with a very fine tooth comb, and um, determined what um, parameters SAP, for example, would use against certain things, and what parameters um, we will put into IS, and we've um, used the same assumption. Um, wherever we think this is a, a good thing to be doing, I mean, we think it's very reasonable. And in some cases, we might have changed it where, to something else where we might think it's appropriate. Hopefully, you should be able to see they're more or less aligned. Um, but there's a couple of things I'll just draw your attention to. Um, number one, we've, we've boosting the air change rate at higher temperatures for our mechanical ventilation system in the design tool. This is, for example, what we, would, um, we might ask for or might specify should happen. Um, to control stuff like overheating, uh, and that of course uses more energy, um, and that's the type of thing that you can't you can't do easily in SAP or even at all. Um, in particular, with this example, one of the things we were looking at is um, uh, lighting and innovative lighting solutions. And so, on uh, for the design tool, we've been playing around with lighting parameters, daylight control. Um, in particular, we were looking at additional carbon savings that could be achieved by specifying um, high-quality LED fittings. Now, SAP assumes that there is a reduction in lighting and it's linked to daylight in some way, but it basically levels out about um, uh, about 30% glazing, and it's the same lighting consumption irrespective. Now, if you wanted to perhaps go to building control and demonstrate that you um, are actually doing something better than SAP, say, for example, you're putting an investment in in terms of um, um, LED lighting and you want to see, um, um, you want to maybe claim that as a carbon saving, or perhaps claim that as a carbon saving against some of the um, 
um, Section 106 um, allowable solutions contributions, which are potentially coming in and already being discussed amongst some local authorities, well, then we can do that with an energy model. Um, you can't necessarily do that with a compliance model. Um, so what, what happens if you plug all of these things in? Well, I've got some results for you, um, and uh, they're, 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 um, they're quite interesting. At least I think they're quite interesting. I hope you also find them interesting. This is what SAP would say um, for different orientations. We've got a northerly and a southerly, um, and different proportions of glazing, and annual carbon emissions for space heating, lighting, and cooling. Um, and across the top, we have an average daylight factor to give you an idea how daylight is improving as your as your uh, as your proportions of glazing increase. Um, and we can see that um, there is a U-shaped curve forming. So there is an optimum space, uh, an optimum glazing level around about the 30 to 40 percent. It's pretty consistent with rules of fun. Um, and as we change the proportion of glazing, we get a change in carbon emissions. Uh, that's actually a little bit more pronounced on the northerly side, and that's uh, in this particular example, that's down to um, increased losses for for, um, for space heating. So that's you you would run it through a Part L compliance tool, and and that's the kind of results you would, you would get. If we were to run that through an actual energy uh, model, you might find the results are quite different. And this is results through more or less exactly the same um, geometry um, with very, very similar assumptions. Um, but this is from a dynamic energy model rather than from, a, um, from the uh, static state compliance tool. Um, and first of all, the carbon emissions in this particular case are higher. So straight away, we're, um, we're, uh, we've got an increase compared to where SAP is saying we, we would be coming, um, the energy would be using the, um, the carbon we'd be producing. Um, the other thing that's going on is we've got more or less a linear relationship with proportions of glazing, and it's not particularly affected by orientation in this particular example. Um, the third thing is that um, as we're increasing our glazing, actually what our energy model is saying is our carbon emissions are going up more than perhaps was being estimated using the steady state compliance tool. Why is this happening, you might ask? Well, I've, I've got a bit of a breakdown for you. Um, this is a comparison at 75% glazing from a northerly aspect of the different um, energy or, um, in this case, carbon emissions for the different uh, for the different fractions we're looking at: space heating, lighting, and cooling. Um, and the heating is quite uh, close; it's 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 within about 20%. The, the lighting is quite close; it's about, again, it's about 20%, and, it's, and both of those are a little bit more. But in this particular example, the cooling load is bigger. So we've got a 50% difference in the estimation in the, in the, of the cooling load. And this is on a northerly facade. If we perhaps look at the southerly facade, now we suddenly find that we've actually got something um, um, uh, slightly different again. Um, heating predictions are actually quite close between the two tools. Um, so there's about, only about a 5% difference in, which is you know, a very small margin of error when you're looking at things in this scale. Again, lighting, there's about a 20% difference, and there's a variety of reasons why that might might be the case. But uh, on the cooling side, we have a, a very large difference. We have a 65% difference in predicted carbon emissions. And what, um, what this is perhaps flagging up as an issue to the design team is actually that um, uh, perhaps we have a, an overheating problem. Perhaps we've got a, a problem with internal temperatures and cooling is being used or cooling is having to react to, to deal with that. And that's an example of how an energy model perhaps can help control some of the risk side of things. I told about taking the carbon benefits on Parcel, but on this side where we're using some innovative perhaps an innovative facade materials, high U values, very low air permeability, low G values, the types of things that are very common now and perhaps were innovative to five years ago. Um, um, those things are a bit of going in. What's the, react, uh, what's the impact of that? Well, perhaps in a very small studio flat, you actually then increase um, the risk of something like overheating. Um, so some, some conclusions for you. Um, Energy modeling isn't for everyone. I've got a very quick slide, a slide summarizing the difference. Um, SAP is a compliance tool. It's testing against building regulations. It uh, has to be simple to use. It's got to be a, a pretty straightforward tool so that everyone can approach it and everyone can use it and, and get some kind of answer. Um, 
design tools are not necessarily appropriate for everyone. You know, single single build housing is not necessarily going to approach design problems using this kind of technology. And you need um, quite highly skilled uh, people to provide inputs and guidance to um, to, to actually get a, a meaningful answer out. If you put um, poor assumptions in, then you tend to get poor results out, and it's it's difficult to know um, what is a correct answer. But it is um, maybe a choice for um, for people who are looking to understand um, innovative solutions and understand the risk behind some of those um, innovative solutions. What we sometimes say is that the design tool allows us to do sustainable um, um, sustainable de uh, design. Um, and last. My last slide is just a few quick conclusions. But one clear message I would like to make is it is unfair to compare these two deals directly. They do have different purposes. Um, and um, I, I think it's um, uh, incorrect to assume that one is better than the other um, for a given scenario. Um, but with an energy model, there are opportunities to actually show um, potential really reductions in carbon. And there, there are then routes sometimes to go to, building control, to go to um, people who are making uh, judgments on carbon emissions and demonstrate that you are doing better than perhaps some of the compliance tools uh, might say. Uh, and the third thing is that by actually using a mix of tools and, and using um, a different approach to solve some of these problems, you might actually help. It might actually help you identify some other design risks that are not picked up when you look at things using a single analysis, and therefore reduce the risk of um, uh, innovation um, causing uh, uh, unintended consequences. And that is the end of my particular part. Great. Well, thanks very much for that, Hugh. Um, it's interesting, really, the last two presentations have picked up on two key challenges regarding innovation, is how do you predict performance and how you measure it afterwards? It really makes the picture much fuzzier and much harder to really evaluate these um, innovations. Now, we're going to move on to our final presenter, who is Ian Gornall, the Head of Manufacturing at St. Helens Knauf Installation. Thank you, Tom. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here to sponsor today's webinar. As Tom said, my name is Ian Gornall. I've been in the insulation industry for 22 years, and I'm currently head of manufacturing at Canalf Insulation's St. Helens Glass Mineral Wool Factory. Knauf Insulation is part of the German family-owned Knauf Group. We're the third largest insulation manufacturer in the world and the UK's leading manufacturer of insulation products where we are the only producer of four types of insulation, that's glass mineral wool, rock mineral wool, extruded polystyrene, and extruded polyethylene. We are, therefore, uh, well placed to provide the most suitable insulin for the application, whether that's for energy efficiency, fire resistance, or acoustic performance in new build residential, residential refurbishment, non-residential buildings, or industrial applications. In the UK, Canalf Insulation employs 585 people at four manufacturing sites in St. Helens, Hartlepool, Queensferry in North Wales, and Cumbran in South Wales. Our mission is to become the world leader in energy efficient systems for buildings. As we know, 40% of the world's energy is used in buildings. To be a credible voice for driving sustainability agenda within our industry and within the wider specification community, and also as a family-owned company producing energy efficiency products, we understand that we've got a responsibility to think and act in a sustainable way. We know that sustainability in buildings is affected more uh, by more than just energy efficiency. It's also about the sustainability of the construction products and the processes by which they're manufactured. With mineral wool, we have a fantastic starting point. Mineral wool is an energy-saving product made from abundant natural raw materials and recycled materials, which during the lifetime of a building can save over 400 times the energy used during its manufacture. Canalf Insulation's earth wool range of glass mineral wool products have an A-plus generic BRE Green Guide rating, which enables them to achieve the maximum number of credits when a BRE environment assessment is compiled. So what about our sustainability journey um, at Canalf Insulation? 
In the UK, canal for insulation's glass mineral wool output has increased by two and a half times between 2002 and 2011 to meet the demand for increased energy efficiency in buildings. We've also achieved rapid growth on mainland Europe, and this has resulted in an increased focus in recent years on sustainability issues. In 2010, Canal for Insulation published its first sustainability report. Our global sustainability objectives are to move towards zero carbon production by committing to reducing our CO2 emissions by 20% by 2020. To move towards zero impact on resource use, in the UK we've already reached our target of greater than 80% recycled glass at our two glass manufacturing factories. To move towards zero waste to landfill, we're committed to a 50% reduction of wastewater by 2020, and in the UK, by the end of this year, uh, we will have achieved our objective of zero waste to landfill at all of our four sites. So what about in innovation? Innovations played a major part in improving the sustainability credentials of our products and our processes. We've listened and responded to the demands of the market, interpreted its requirements, and delivered solutions. In 2005, for example, we installed state-of-the-art compression packaging technology in all of our glass mineral wool factories. This allowed us to unitize multiple packs and compress the insulation during packaging to as little as one-tenth of its original volume. This obviously reduces storage space, but also the environmental impact of transportation, since more insulation can be delivered by fewer trucks. We also made the packaging weatherproof to eliminate the need for expensive covered storage. In the last four years, we've developed state-of-the-art spinner manufacturing facilities in Europe and the US to supply all of our glass mineral wool factories with spinners. The spinner is the key component in converting molten glass into glass fiber. We've also developed more efficient fiberizing technology so that a higher proportion of raw materials are converted into insulation. However, probably our most innovative and successful development is Ecos technology. Ecos technology is a revolutionary formaldehyde-free binder technology based on rapidly renewable materials instead of petra-based chemicals. For those not familiar with the mineral wool manufacturing process, imagine that fibers are spun from molten glass or rock, after which they're coated with a liquid, or binder as we call it, which glues the fibers together to form quilts or slabs of insulation. Binder technology in the mineral wool industry has, for decades, been based on resins containing petra-based chemicals. Ecos technology is not only made from rapidly renewable materials, it's free from formaldehyde, phenol, acrylics, and also contains no artificial colors. In 2009, Canal for Insulation converted all glass mineral factories in the US and Europe to Ecos technology. The technology is patented worldwide by Knauf, and whilst it was developed for the mineral wool insulation uh, product, it also offers the same potential benefits to other building products where resin substitution would be an advantage, such as wood-based panels, for example. We understand that innovation demands calculated risk-taking. We also understand that specifiers, customers, and end users expect that we undertake rigorous testing of new technology and products to minimize the risk to the lowest practicable level. Ecos technology was the result of five years of intensive research and development, extensive manufacturing trials at all manufacturing locations, long-term product testing, and independent recertification of all product families before we launched. So glass mineral wool made with Ecos technology offers superior levels of sustainability. We now have an energy saving pro product made from more than 80% recycled material and bonded using a bio-based technology free from formaldehyde. Because there's no need for added formaldehyde, it contributes to improved indoor air quality and Knauf Insulation was the first company in the world to receive the coveted Eurofins gold standard for indoor air quality. So clearly, glass mineral wool with Ecos technology improves the sustainability credentials of the buildings in which it's used. And we've had an interesting inquiry this week from BAM, who are working on a new build project for Google. 
they're targeting the stringent Bream Outstanding and the LEED Platinum ratings. And Google have a list of banned substances, which they refer to as the red list, which cannot be present in any building products and materials used on the project. This specifically rules out the use of any products with added formaldehyde. Also, the products uh, exhibit superior levels of handling. We conducted installer trials throughout Europe before we launched this technology with over 500 individual installers. More than 90% of professional installers stated that glass mineral wool with Ecos technology has a softer feel and is less itchy compared to conventional mineral wool. More than 80% of installers state that they prefer the neutral smell of mineral wool with Ecos technology over the smell of traditional glass mineral wool. So in summary, ambitious government targets and clients' own sustainability agendas have placed a greater emphasis on the sustainability of buildings than ever before. Our customers are increasingly expecting high-performance, sustainable products manufactured in a sustainable way. And equally, specifiers are required to balance sustainability, building performance, as well as legislative compliance. We see our role as a manufacturer to push the boundaries of technology by developing high-performance, innovative solutions and systems that meet client and specifiers' sustainability and technical requirements. So, for example, we've heard about the Marks & Spencer Cheshire Oak Sustainable Learning Store with its 100% FSC glue lamp roof. The insulation in that roof is glass mineral wool made with Ecos technology. Increasingly, products must be more reliable and deliver real performance over the lifetime of a building and more. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, we've got a few minutes to take some questions now. Um, quite a few come through. Um, I mean, picking up on the point I made earlier and really what some of the presenters have um, mentioned is really this whole challenge of A, predicting performance, but B, measuring it. Um, there is a question here um, specifically aimed at Manish, which is probably most relevant because you are doing so much on this um, area. So, I mean, I mean, the question is actually ask, asking, I mean, do you have difficulties with measuring and monitoring how your existing store's innovation is actually performing in use? And how do you capture learning to inform what you do next? Okay, I'll, I'll take the first part of that question. Um, it, it, it is a challenge. It's not easy, but we do it as best as we can. So um, if, if the metric we use for, say, energy efficiency retrofit into existing estate is obviously energy usage, then um, all of our stores have half-hourly uh, meter reading data available, not just to us, but to them as well. So we can assess how that's doing. We also put um, sub-metering, etc., on the innovation that we try um, in each store, maintain a good asset list of the innovations that are going into the stores um, as a trial initially, and then if they're successful as a rollout, and check back against the predicted uh, performance that was um, anticipated uh, to make sure that we're hitting the targets we want to. Uh, there is a point that I'd like to make around innovation. We, we, very rarely in a building would you just put one particular technology in. It's often a combination. And one of our key learnings, particularly in retrofit, is how they work with each other. Uh, and a good example of this is if you go LED, for example, in your entire building, what people have underestimated is the kind of heat provision that non-LED or traditional lighting provides. And that's been quite an interesting thing. The second question is how do we measure um, how do we how do we evaluate the, the I think the new buildings um, we do detailed post occupancy evaluations in Cheshire Oaks we're doing so in partnership with the Technology Strategy Board as part of their building performance evaluation program so it's not just us doing it against our criteria it's actually against um, an industry sort of leading criteria as well and we'll, and because we're part of that program we'll share we'll share the data great thanks Manish. Um Really looking at picking up on um, Hugh's presentation, which is the whole predictability issue. I mean, it's very hard to, if you can't um, predict how something's going to perform, um, you know, you always begs the question, why you, almost why do you, would you bother? Um, do you, Hugh, do you know if there's any legislative intent to improve SAP in the foreseeable future and bring it closer to uh, the more dynamic tools used for modelling? Um, I, uh, that was one of the, uh, I think it's a very interesting question. It's one I hear quite um, quite frequently. Um, to link to Menesh's point, um, the, I think one of the challenges going forward is that um, in, you know, in terms of measures of sustainability when it comes to energy, um, there, is always a, uh, there is always a check in that 
there's a, a meter at the end of the uh, the end of some you know a gas pipe at the end of the uh, electrical wire, um, even even to the extent of you know the the truck you're bringing in to bring you oil or biomass or whatever it is, um, and so the challenge going forward with 2016 and 2019 is I think a lot of buildings where innovation has been deployed, um, uh, potentially you're going to have still quite substantial energy usage, um, and and. How understanding that and understanding the causes of that is, I mean, it's a huge field, and it's um, and I think it's a a, a, a large issue for for the industry. Um, what I'd say about SAP and and dynamic tools um, is that I think SAP is um, is 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 widely misunderstood uh, and has historically been quite poorly used. Um, that that is now improving. Um, to a certain extent, um, but SAP is linked into the real world. Uh, it's it's based upon uh, based upon um, you know surveys and some of them are relatively recent surveys of how people actually use energy. You know what the annual energy usage is. So for certain things, it's actually very accurate. Things like um, predicting an um, overall electrical usage, it can be surprisingly good. Um, things like predicting occupancy, um, it's 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 been shown to be again not that bad when you look at a building in uh, sorry when you look at building usage as a national picture um, and so from that perspective it's 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 surprisingly powerful in seeing um, you know how things are actually used versus you know going through a lot of dynamic assessment and 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 trying to predict how things um, are going to be used um, so I'm not sure. I can't comment on the legislation, the legislation side, because um, um, I'm not involved in the legislative side. I do know that the SAP has been continually improving and been continually being being refined to try and improve its um, um, its energy uh, prediction. I think there's always going to be a role for energy modelling. As I as I said, it's a, it's a, de a different type of animal. Um, the the big um the big connection between the two that needs sorting out is how people use buildings and how people interact with some of the innovative systems um, because that sometimes surprises you know that surprises engineers as well great thanks um, I've got another question from Manish I think this is quite relevant um, the question is asking asking how MS appraise the risk of longevity of LED lighting with a lot of very variable quality <coughs> products out there I mean LED is really becoming to the fore now but there are also a lot of issues with performance. Um, I'd be interested to hear how you manage that. Yeah, sure. I mean, firstly, it's, it's um, you know, collaborating closely with the manufa manufacturers. We, we work with a number of manufacturers for LED, um, so them understanding the kind of performance that we want from their product. Um, and then real in-depth uh, um, performance um, evaluation, along with um, keeping them close to us for the first few years of, well, certainly for the first 18 months of that performance as part of the overall post-occupancy evaluation. So I suppose the underlying point there is collaboration, is, is not just working with them to, to buy, you know, just buy the product off them, but working with them to install it, working with them to uh, see how it performs in use uh, right right into a, a time when it's accept, you know, there's a period of time when it's acceptable and it's fully bedded in. I think uh, if I could just um, comment on the LED is a prime example of your first poll question in that um, the standards base has been up to recently relatively immature. Again, that's improving. Um, and um, it's a classic example of, um, um, to a certain extent, you, you, you pay for what you get. And if you go to the premium products and the, the, the manufacturers who are investing a lot in R&D, um, and I'm trying to understand the problem design issues surrounding um, LED. Um, you can get a lot of information. You can, again, try and understand how this is going to perform. But if you just pick the technology um, and, um, and pick a, a, some form of it without going into those cuts of depths of um, analysis, then um, there, are, there are pitfalls out there, and there are pitfalls which um, many people are falling into, I think. All right. Thanks very much, sir. I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, but we haven't an answered to answer everybody's questions, but um, what we're going to do is um, give the questions to our presenters, and hopefully they'll have to find some time to email you some answers to these. So uh, all it remains for me to do is to thank today's panel, Manish Datta, Ross Holleran, Hugh Blackwell, and Ian Gornall, and also to our sponsor, Canal Insulation and Ecos Technology. Thanks very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>